Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you. Thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to worship with you. I greet you in the name of Christ, who is the center of our faith, the one who invites us to walk in the way of faith. As you were coming in, you saw elements for communion. I encourage you to grab those uh, for our time of gathering around the Lord's table a little bit later on in our service. Before we join in a call to worship, though, I want to take time to recognize the significance of this weekend as we remember the attacks on 9-11. It was a moment of shared pain for all in our country. And by remembering, we do a few things. We honor those who died that day. We honor the first responders who put themselves at risk by coming to the aid and help of others. In moments of pain and of terror, we often, uh, the question is often asked, where is God? And as Christians, we acknowledge that God meets us right in the midst of our pain, that God enters our mess and invites us to walk in ways of peace. And so by remembering, we also commit ourselves to discern the way of peace in our own time and consider what the good news of Jesus Christ looks like in our world. So I pray that we would do that reflectively, pray that we would do that honestly as we go about the process of discernment and moving forward um, after these 20 years. So I invite you to stand and join in our together and our call to worship. Madeline is coming and she's going to lead us. Good morning. It's wonderful to be able to worship with you all today. Please join me in our call to worship this morning. This will be a responsive reading, so please join as instructed on the screen. We are branches rooted in the vine of Christ. We come because we seek to abide in Christ. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. We come because we long to be spiritually vibrant, alive, productive. If we abide in Christ, then Christ's words abide in us. We come because we strive to be faithful disciples. We gather for worship now to the glory of one God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. May we grow wildly as God tends us lovingly. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder we revere. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. The beloved of the Lord One with everlasting kindness But with sacrificial blood Bringing reconciliation To a world that longs to know The affections of the Father Who will never let us go Rejoice Come and lift your hands and raise your voice he is worthy of all praise rejoice sing the mercies of your king and with heart soaring rejoice all our sickness all our sorrow jesus carried up the hill he has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the struggle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice! When you cry to Him, He hears your voice. He will suffering he will help you sing rejoice come and lift your hands and raise your 
darkness we were waiting without hope with our light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise for to the King of Kings. Amen. To reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw it through the that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel, shall not faint By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me God, we are so grateful for your presence. Lord, for your work in us and in creation and the story that you're telling from the beginning of time. That you're a God who's loving and caring and creative and nurturing. And Lord, that you ask us to partner with you in the good work of caring for this earth and caring for one another. God, we're grateful for the moments in which you seem to break through all of our circumstances and we're in awe and standing before you. Lord, if we're honest, there are plenty of times in which we don't feel you, we don't see you. And whether that's because we've drawn away or circumstances have clouded our vision, Lord, we confess. And God, we express our desire. Lord, we desire to see you, to know you. 
In this moment, church, I invite you just into a moment of reflection over the days, the weeks previous, maybe the days to come. What's concerning you? What's weighing heavy on you? Perhaps there are things to confess. What joys, what excitements, what are you looking forward to? I invite you to just be mindful and lay these before the feet of Jesus this morning. Church, I invite you now to join us in our corporate prayer this morning. It'll be on the screens for you. Please join me in praying this ancient prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may seek not so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Jesus said, if you reside in me and my words reside in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Friends, we have asked for forgiveness and correction. It has been truly done for us. It is being done for us, and it is being done in us. Please join me in saying, thanks be to God. Amen.
Children, you may be dismissed to your classes. Church, let us turn and greet each other in the name of the Lord this morning. All right, as we draw back together, before Pastor Andy comes to bring the sermon, we will ask Pastor Andy, go ahead and join me up here. I don't know if any of you remember, some of you may have been here, Morgan, 15 years ago today was Pastor Andy's first day here at Emmaus Road. So we are recognizing Andy and the family's 15th anniversary with us. We're so great. Yeah. Andy, we're so grateful for your heart, for your desire to lead a church that is seeking God's kingdom and a part of God's kingdom, a church that you and I and the rest of us would like to attend. Hmm. That means so much to us. And thank you so much for giving so much, Amy and the girls, as part of this ministry. You are so wonderful. Anyway, from the church, on behalf of all of us, here's this. Thank you so Great. much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that recognition. You know, 15 years is uh, quite a long time to stay at one place, uh, both for the leader, but also for the congregation. So it's uh, also a feat of yours to allow me to just continue to speak into your lives uh, over the last 15 years. Um, somebody told me once that if you attend a church for about three years, you've heard everything the pastor has to say. Um, <laughs> And of course, I took offense at that, because <laughs> uh, the truth is, as leaders, we grow, we change, we come to see things differently, and in many ways, you all have just kind of come along uh, the journey with me and my family, so thank you so much for uh, just your generosity and your hospitality and care uh, over the course of these 15 years. We are truly grateful. 
Uh, let me share, uh, right, to bi- right back to business, let me share some announcements of things that are happening in the life of the church. Uh, FFH Host Week is coming up uh, beginning on October 3rd through the 10th. Uh, this is a tremendous ministry where we have the opportunity to partner with and uh, show support for uh, families who are experiencing homelessness in our communities. So they'll be uh, staying on site at our building, which means we have just a lot of opportunities uh, for you to be involved. And that includes overnight hosts, dinner preparation, laundry afterwards, set up and tear down, uh, all of those things. And so uh, if you check out the newsletter, if you go to uh, the Church Center app, all of those places, you can find the link to sign up. Um, If those things don't mean anything to you or they're intimidating to you, just mark on your bulletin that you want to help with FFH. We'll get you in touch with our coordinators who can help you with that sign-up process and get you uh, signed up to help out. Uh, The last thing I want to mention is there are a number of uh, things coming up this fall that you'll want to mark your calendars for. They're listed there in your bulletin. Uh, There's some opportunities for connection with other people here at the church. Uh, We have a couple of discovery classes coming up. We've had a number of new folks be joining us over the last uh, several weeks and months. And so if you're new or new-ish and want to know kind of what makes our ministry tick, we encourage you to join our uh, discovery classes uh, that will help you kind of learn all about uh, the ministry here. So uh, pay attention to those upcoming events. Well, uh, we're in uh, week three of a series that we're calling Broken Signposts, and broken signposts are things in our world uh, that point us to greater meaning uh, and help us make sense of the world, but sometimes disappoint us or let us down. Uh, That is to say, they are signposts because they point beyond themselves, but they're broken because our experience of these things is really messy. And so in this series, we're going to be looking at things through a Christian lens to try and make sense of these themes, but also try to get a sense of what God is up to uh, in the world, God's activity in the world. So in the first week, for example, we looked at uh, the theme of justice. And we learn that God's justice is restorative, which is to say that uh, it isn't just, God's justice is not the perfection of a system where the punishment is equal to the crime, but rather God seeks to restore us into right relationship with God, others, and creation. And so that's restorative justice. It has all kinds of implications in our lives. And then last week we looked at the theme of love. Uh, how love is this, this great thing that helps to center us, make sense of our lives, but our experience of love is really messy. Uh, so ultimately, w- though love is often misunderstood in our culture, we need to look ultimately at the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus to help us make sense of what love and authentic love and divine love looks like. Uh, today, I want to turn our attention to the third broken signpost, Uh, And again, just like the first couple weeks, just a tiny little subject here that can easily be covered in a single message, right? You can hear the sarcasm. Uh, We're going to look at the theme of spirituality, of spirituality, and uh, certainly we need prayer uh, to do so. So let's let's say a word of prayer. Uh, Gracious God, thank you so much for this group of people today that have set aside time to uh, gather, to pursue you, uh, to gain instruction to encourage one another uh, to be connected as the body of Christ. We give thanks for this time. We pray now that as we give our attention to the scriptures that you would, uh, in fact, instruct us, but not for the purpose of just gaining more information or um, gaining new insights. Lord, as we explore the scriptures, uh, we pray that we would be formed more into your likeness, that your Holy Spirit would be freely at work Uh, in us, um, that we might be shaped and transformed. So God, um, thank you for your goodness. Be with us in these moments, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Throughout human history, uh, in all cultures, in all time, uh, people of all places have been drawn to this thing called worship. Uh, That is to say that every human culture has had some concept of a being or beings uh, that are bigger or larger than themselves. All human cultures have had some concept of the divine. And this awareness then of the divine has led all human cultures in some form or another, certainly taking on a wide breadth of forms, to a spiritual life, to some sort of spiritual practice. 
And so I have a, a, a little uh, exercise for us. You don't have to answer out loud, but I want you to think about these things in your mind. When I say the word spirituality, what do you think of? Again, I'm not asking for public responses. Uh, that, might, that might be pretty intimidating. But think about it in your mind. What, when I say the word spirituality, what comes to mind or what do you think of? Another way of thinking about this is, is what do you think we mean when we say things like our spiritual life? Um, or sometimes you've heard this, people talk about having a spiritual experience. What do they mean by that? Or what do you think they might mean when they talk about having a spiritual experience? Uh, perhaps your mind goes to things like worship or expressions of worship, whether those are outward expressions, maybe the raising of hands during uh, music in a church service, maybe some measure or expression of private devotion to God or to the divine. Uh, or maybe spirituality is simply a, a generic term, kind of a, a catch-all term that we use to describe the things that we try to do to find connection with the divine. Right? Maybe that's kind of the, a, a helpful way of thinking about spirituality. All the things that we try to do to find connection to the divine. There's actually quite a bit to think about when we, when we start offering and thinking about questions like this, but I want to add a layer of complication, if I might, here right at the beginning of the message. And that layer of complication is, uh, what if I asked, on top of questions like that, if I asked the question of how are spirituality and religion similar or different? Whoa, now things get pretty muddy, right? Now things are starting to get really messy. Um, or maybe messy isn't the word, maybe nuanced, maybe complicated, maybe layered. As we think about what is religion and spirituality, here's another way of asking that same question. What is the relationship between religion and spirituality? Over the last few generations in America, it's become more popular to see religion as the dusty, boring, and mostly unnecessary thing, while also maintaining or seeking to maintain a private spirituality. Uh, in, in my years as a pastor, I've come across a good number of people who inform me uh, that they're tired of religion, uh, but consider themselves spiritual. Most of the time, it's in the context of telling me they'll no longer be attending church. <laughs> um, and so it's become quite popular to pursue spirituality while rejecting religion. Religion is often understood as an old idea, an unnecessary weight to carry. And spirituality, on the other hand, frees us from that weight while also allowing us to pursue the deep spiritual questions of life. Now let me say here, let me pause. I don't know how the words so far this morning have hit you, uh, what's rising up in your, emotional, in your emotions, but let me say this that I have a lot of compassion for everyone's journey of faith and wherever that may lead them, in whatever direction that may lead them. Uh, I understand that sometimes there is trauma caused by religious institutions, religious leaders, and oftentimes it requires space for that trauma to heal from those institutions, from those leaders or other people in those same positions. And so as I explore these themes this morning, I want you to hear and to understand that it comes from a place of compassion. I want you to hear and understand that it comes from a place of understanding that there's a lot of nuance to the human experience and that we must be compassionate toward other people's journeys of faith. That there is not a one-size-fits-all. It isn't accurate to lay a burden of guilt on anyone for any choice that they've made related to their spiritual life or their religious life. Are you with me? Okay? So I want to I turn to the Scriptures to help give us some guidance, to help give us some grounding. I want to help to understand these things, but my purpose this morning is not to lay on any burden of guilt whatsoever for how you are choosing to navigate the complexities of the divine and the spiritual, in our, in our connection with the divine, um, and how that might play out. And so, how can we turn then to the scriptures to think about Christian spirituality and the, and the relationship also with Christian religion? Um, I promise we're going to get to a passage of scripture this morning, but often it's helpful to kind of fly at 10,000 feet, right? Try to get our bearing, get some context. And so that's what I want to do this morning. I promise we're getting there. And if you want to turn or click there, we'll be in John 15. Uh, but let's just uh, take a moment to get some context. And so as we often do, let's begin with the Old Testament. 
with the story of ancient Israel because we need to begin there often because it is out of this story and out of this people uh, that Jesus, our Messiah, comes. And so Jesus is always firmly rooted in a context. Uh, one, of the, one of the mistakes that modern uh, churches, Christianity, and the expression of Christianity that we've made is we tend to think about Jesus a contextually. That is, we just kind of plop Jesus. We don't consider the context of Jesus. We just say, oh, here's Jesus, kind of like spread him over your life, right? Which is like such a weird metaphor. But, um, but, but, but like you understand what I'm saying. Like, so let's just begin here to understand that Jesus is always firmly rooted in a story, in a context. Uh, And so for ancient Israel, speaking about or thinking about spirituality, any concept of spirituality for ancient Israel would have included two things. First is the temple, and second is the Torah. Now, now the temple we talked about a a bit a little bit last week. Temple was the the intersection of of heaven and earth. It was the location of God's glory and divine presence. In the minds of ancient Israelites, God had an address. And that was the temple. So uh, any concept of worship, any concept of devotion was connected to a physical place, was connected to a building. I want you to hear that. Any concept of worship or devotion was connected to a physical place and a building for ancient Israelites. It was absolutely central to their life of going to the temple in order to show devotion, in order to worship. Now, What we now know is we recognize and know Jesus as the fulfillment of the temple. We understand that God's presence fills all of the earth. We understand that worship can take place anywhere. We know these things, and yet we still have this instinct to gather at a place, to set aside a sacred space to encounter God, to talk about and wrestle with the divine. Right, And so we still have this instinct to build chapels and churches and parking lots around them so we can easily access them, right? We still have this instinct to have this physical place because we meet in this church. And so any concept of saying, hey, the church is not the building, it's the people, yes, amen, 100% true, but let's not overlook the, the, in, the instinct that we have to set aside a space in which we can encounter the divine. Okay, which of course now we know is not the only place we can encounter the divine, but it's a place that we can go regularly to do that. Now, so the temple was where you got a sense of God's glory, uh, to be close to God's loving presence, to be reminded of God's power. The temple was where all the action was at. Perhaps this is why the psalmist writes in Psalm 84, happy are those who live in your house ever singing your praise. All right, the temple. But if you were an ancient Israelite, the temple could very easily be far away, not very accessible. So how in the world did you practice spirituality? How how did you have any sense of, of worship or faithfulness without easy access, daily access to the temple? You couldn't always be at the temple. In fact, most of your life was probably spent away from the temple. And so how was an ancient Israelite to practice any spirituality away from the temple? The answer was the Torah. Now, uh, Torah is a fancy word that means law or instruction. And the Torah, as they would have known it, is what we know as the first five books of our Bible. Uh, So these books contain the great narrative of God's rescue of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, called the Exodus, And then they also include the law, which includes the Ten Commandments, but also hundreds of other laws. And if you want great nighttime devotional reading, just turn to the Torah and just read some of the laws. I promise you'll be asleep quickly, (laughs) right? I mean, it's just like, it's not super riveting reading, uh, but this is in fact the laws that were given to this people. Uh, And so it includes, yes, the Ten Commandments, but hundreds of other laws, and these Holy instructions served a very distinct purpose in the life of ancient Israel, and that is it regulated Jewish life. 
And so they gave clarity to how life was be, to, to be conducted on all fronts. They provided the framework for how to handle certain situations. They provided instructions for how to go about worship. It, they, allowed a, they, they provided clarity for what was allowed and what not was, was not allowed, etc., etc., etc. These laws, hundreds of them, regulated life for the ancient Israelites. And then when something wasn't clear, or if something came up in your life that wasn't covered in the law, there were the scribes and the Pharisees who were ready with delight to tell you exactly how that law applied to your life. Okay? Um, anytime I'm thinking about the law and like the, this regulating life, like as I've been studying this week, all week there's been one song running through my mind. Can you guess what it is? Tradition, tradition, right? From Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> That's right. Because Temple and Torah together provided a framework for our ancient brothers and sisters to practice their faith, right? It provided a path for them to walk, a way of being in the world that held them together and grounded them which is exactly what the opening scene of Fiddler on the Roof says. Why do we practice these things? It grounds our life. It roots our life in something predictable. Tradition is the very thing that holds us together. This idea of holding together, we're going to get to later on in the message. Now, fast forward to Jesus' day. Jesus, who is the true temple, comes, he enters the temple, he critiques it through prophetic theater, he overturns the tables of the money changers, cracks a whip to drive out the animals, he's angry at the injustice that the temple system has perpetuated, which is exploiting the poor and hindering the worship of Gentiles. But then not only that, when you see Jesus showing critique in his life, the scribes and the Pharisees are often at the blunt end of it. And that is the scribes and the Pharisees have taken this system that was meant to provide a guide for life, and they have turned it into a system of guilt. So where the Torah once delightfully guided people, it now burdens them, and the religious leaders are right in the center of it, and Jesus critiques the whole thing. So temple and Torah are the center of spirituality for ancient Israel. Jesus comes in and shows how they've become corrupted, been misleading people, leading them away from their true intention. And Jesus then comes and essentially lives out the purpose of these two things. Says, I am the fulfillment of the Torah. I am the fulfillment of the temple. And so what was once, and here's what I want you to hear, what was once a path, to walk that they might connect with and delight in God had become a religious system complicit with empire and focused on self-preservation. And this is what Jesus critiques. Jesus critiques the fact that this thing that was intended for good and meant to connect people to God has now become simply a religious system that's kind of got one hand in the pocket of empire and is focused on self-preservation. And this is the part of the message where we get to the scriptures. That's the context. That's what we need to have in mind. That's what we need to know before we come to the passage of scripture, which is found in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, in this context and into this context, Jesus says this, um, and we had lots of time to turn there this morning, so I'll just jump right in. Jesus says this in John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. For every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. For you've already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. For just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. But whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you.
my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's really important context. The into this world, Jesus speaks these words. Now, of course, there's a lot in this passage. Books, commentaries galore have been written just on John 15. So there's much to explore. But this morning, I want to just kind of, again, fly at 10,000 feet over this passage, capture the mood, capture the feeling, capture the expression of this passage. And the expression of this passage is one of intimate connection between Jesus and his followers. Intimate connection between Jesus and his followers. Notice the language of connection, this, this idea of abiding, this idea of remaining. These all speak to an intimacy with God. Which leads me to think that if John the Gospel writer were here in the worship service this morning, and we asked him, what does it mean to be spiritual? Now remember, John the Gospel writer is, is, has all this context of, of Torah and temple and how Jesus is now kind of entering in and critiquing what those systems have become and what they've come to do versus their original intention. John the Gospel writer has all that context, all of that history. If he were here with us this morning and we said, what does it mean to be spiritual? I have a hunch that he would point us to this metaphor of the vine and the branches. He would recognize Jesus as the fulfillment of the temple. He would recognize Jesus as as coming to show and demonstrate that the law is now written on our hearts through the Spirit of Christ. That he would want us to know that as Christians, any connection with God is connection with Jesus. For Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. And that the Spirit of Christ lives in us. And so any connection with God also is some sort of connection with other people a recognition of their humanity. And he wants us to know that this deep knowing of Jesus and this character of, and the deep knowing of the character of God is possible. And that meaningful relationship with God is possible. And so John's vision of spirituality, I believe, is one of friendship between the faithful and Jesus empowered by the Spirit. There you go, right back to Sunday school when you were growing up. Friendship with Jesus. And so it turns out, actually, that the instinct for spirituality throughout human history is correct. Our propensity towards spiritual expression is right on. There is space in our lives to work out the deeper questions, to explore the deeper things, and to enter into full awareness. And the gospel writer sees Jesus as the fulfillment of the temple and the Torah, therefore being the center of spiritual life. If Jesus is the fulfillment of temple and Torah, and those things were the center of spiritual life for ancient Israel, I believe the gospel writer of John would say our spiritual life as Christians is centered on Jesus. Does this make sense? But then what about religion, and what does this mean for religious expression? Religious institutions, right? I don't want to get too far off in the weeds here, but let me offer what I hope will be helpful insight. The word religion comes from the Latin root ligere, which means to bind or connect. It's where we get our word ligament, which holds and binds together. So the word religion comes from the Latin root ligere, which means to bind or connect. The intent of religion is to hold us together, to bind us to God and to one another, Otherwise, life will simply pull us apart. Life will pull us in a thousand different directions. So religion is a set of practices or rituals that are meant to hold us together and connect us to God. Here's my observation. When a lot of people um, get frustrated with institutional religion, they often just begin to practice religion in some other form. They still have a whole set of rituals and practices that help to bind them together, to help hold their life together. And so my, my, uh, my thought or my feeling is that we can't so easily separate the idea of being spiritual from the idea of being religious. 
Because any connection toward the divine comes with some set of practices or rituals to do that. Now, they may happen inside of a church or not. They may happen inside of, they may be like part of a historic faith or not, but they are still practices and rituals that seek to bind us together. So the purpose of religion is to bind us to one another and to God, quite literally by the, by the meaning of the word. So let me, offer, let me offer some observations, and I want to, again, to communicate my heart of compassion here. The problem is that religion in our context, in our context, I mostly mean the American evangelical context, um, the problem is that religion in our context, instead of being centered on a set of practices meant to hold us together and to God, has really become centered on a set of beliefs. So instead of being practice-centered, it's come, become beliefs-centered. Uh, it's become more about dogma than walking a path. And here's the trouble with that. When, when religion is centered on dogma, while also trying and seeking to promote connection with Jesus, there's a fundamental disconnect, right? So we kind of grew, maybe you grew up in church, you heard about this thing called friendship with Jesus, connection with God through Christ, but instead of giving a set of practices to help you connect, you were told that prayer is just talking to God, and you were then told all the right things to believe. So there was a fundamental disconnect between the end goal, that is connection with Jesus, or connection with the divine through Christ, but then how you get there is just believe the right things, and we have a whole generation of people who have believed the right things, but feel fundamentally disconnected from God. Are you with me? There might be some resonance if you're like, say, 45 and under in the room, right? Um, so there's this fundamental disconnect, which is why you have, in my observation, so uh, there was a little riff. I'm going to go back to the notes. <laughs> notes, like sticking with the notes is always safer. So uh, this is why you have, in my observation, I think others would agree, whole generations of Christians who have grown up with information training about Jesus but have no real experience of Jesus. The religious system was all about a system of belief while trying to promote connection with Jesus. And now what's happening is that generation is evaluating the role of religion in their lives because religion mostly served to tell them what to think and offered very little in terms of practices or rituals to connect with the living Christ. Now, moment of honesty, vulnerability. I am a product of information-based religion. And so I'm still working all these things out. I don't have all the answers. I have some hunches. I have some leanings of what this might mean or imp certain implications, but please don't misunderstand me to think that because I'm on the platform and have a microphone that I feel like I have everything figured out, because I don't. That as a product of information-based religion who went to seminary where I learned to think about God and got this weird thing called Master of Divinity. Who named that degree? <laughs> to think that anyone could become a master of the divine. Like, this is so bizarre, right? And so, you have, so I have all this information, all this head knowledge, and yet my own experience is like this longing for this connection which is, in fact, why, as a church, I feel like we've kind of tried to adopt a set of practices and rituals that will hopefully serve to connect us to God and to one another and serve the purpose of religion. So I don't have all the answers, but I am confident that the Scriptures point us to an intimacy with God through the Spirit. John 15, I am the vine. You are the branches. Abide. Remain. And I'm also convinced that while the Scriptures invite us into an intimacy with God, that part of what will get us there is practices and rituals in addition to teaching and instruction for right thinking. But can I say this? 
to the Evangelical Church of America, we cannot think our way into intimacy with God. We cannot think our way into intimacy with God. There, at some level, there has to be an experience with God. And the trouble is, is we go to discipleship classes, and discipleship classes are usually what? Uh, where you go and you dump more information uh, into your religious brain, and you kind of learn more facts and all of that. Uh, and, and yet, there's not a set of practices. Um, let me take this moment to point out one of our life groups. Daniel and Melissa are leading a life group that is leaning into a set of practices. Um, and so, yes, there's going to be some information, uh, but it's like, hey, let's take this information, let's take this scripture, let's take this insight, and then let's adopt a practice of engagement with God. And so maybe that's uh, a certain way of, pr- or, or a new way of praying. Maybe that's going on a hike to experience God in, cr- in creation and in nature. Like, just kind of exploring all kinds of different practices, rituals, ways of experiencing the presence of God. And so, we can't think our way into intimacy with God. We must practice the way. We must walk the path. Now, l- let me say this, because I know it, it always comes up. Um, I know what you're thinking, rituals and practices, especially when they are repeated, um, lose their impact in our lives because they become rote. We lose our concept of meaning because we do them over and over again. Um, <clears throat> the practices that we do as a church, number one, are always optional. You don't have to receive communion. Uh, you don't have to say the prayers or sing the songs. Uh, they're always optional. Uh, but the practices and rituals are designed to lead you into a relationship and experience of the divine through Christ. But they only do that insofar as, much, insofar as we faithfully engage in them, right? So the engagement with these sets of practices is what helps us ex- like meet their end of, uh, of experiencing the divine. So if you say the Lord's Prayer without any thought of what you are praying, or if you are wondering how long prayers of the people is going to last instead of engaging with the prayer, uh, or if you are disgusted because this is the third week in a row we've sung this song, um, then there's a good chance that those rituals aren't helping you to experience the divine. Um, even though that's their intended purpose. And so they're always optional. So if you're like, oh, I don't like this song, that's okay for you to not sing. Um, but as we say the Lord's Prayer, I would encourage you to like, consider what does it mean for us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And maybe if there's a line or something in the, in the prayer that just sticks out, just stop there. You don't have to say the rest of the prayer. Stop there. Take time to reflect. <clears throat> and so this morning, again, I don't mean in any way to um, not honor the spiritual journey of someone. I don't intend in any way to lay on additional burdens of guilt. And if I've done that, I ask your forgiveness and the forgiveness of Christ. My hope simply is to invite us to see that Christianity is not so much a set of beliefs as a path to walk. And yes, there are beliefs, and yes, there are sort of like essential things to say this is Christian, right? And it's a set of beliefs. Yes, I'm there. I'm with you 100%. But I want to move us away from just thinking about Christianity in terms of belief and recognizing Christianity as a path to be walked. And so I invite us to see that the practices, rituals, and rhythms of a religious life can lead us into a deeply spiritual life if we will faithfully engage. I invite us into friendship with God through the practices of the church in community with others so that we all might walk the path of Jesus together. Amen. Amen. I know I've given us a lot to think about, as I think was true in the first and second weeks of our series, and probably will be true through the rest of the series. And I also just want to reiterate that sermons 
are never finished. They're only delivered. Which is to say that next week, next month, next year, or 15 years from now, I may look back at this sermon and say, here's all the things I got wrong. And there was a point, actually, when we were switching podcast services, I told Daniel, don't upload anything from this year or before. Because I've, I've changed who I am. I, I don't want my name attached to some of those sermons. <laughs> you know, so don't upload them. They weren't that good, and they were, some of them were just flat wrong, right? And, and so... Um, As we all grow and change and lean into these things, may we offer each other and one another grace. Let me lead us to the Lord's table today. Well, first I want to pray, and then I'll lead us to the table. Gracious God, um, this thing called faith is certainly a journey. This thing called spirituality is in many ways, inherent to the human condition, this sense of the divine or this rejection of the divine, but either way, we are aware of the divine, the possibility of something for which the only word we can find is God. And so, Lord, we're confounded by this thing called spirituality Today we also wrestle, God, with the place, the purpose of religion. And we confess that the ways in which we have organized ourselves in terms of practice and belief in these things called religion often have caused a lot of harm. And so, God, we ask forgiveness. But we also recognize that in its truest form, religion can be a true gift. It provides ways in which it provides a path to walk, to connect with you. And so God, today as Christians, as those who profess faith in Jesus Christ or those who are here at least exploring and and considering faith in Christ, we today make the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we serve a God who loved humanity enough to become a human, to enter into the mess, to take on our pain, to in fact offer us rescue, salvation. And so God, we pray now that as we gather around the Lord's table to remember these things, that it would not just be a remembrance, but it would also very profoundly be an experience. That as we take in these elements of bread and juice, that we would, in fact, experience the very presence of God. That we would be reminded today of your great love for us, that we would be shown the way of salvation, that there might be something that we need guidance, correction on, and that you would speak to us. Whatever it is, Lord, meet us at your table, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you haven't already, I encourage you to get elements for communion. They're located in the foyer. And for those of you worshiping at home, thanks again for joining us. This is a great time to find elements around your home that represent the body and blood of Christ. Let's gather around the Lord's table today. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to see you in this common bread and in our common lives. In our hunger and in our fullness, in our despair and in our hope, in our worship and in our work, And we invite you also, Lord, to feed us with with bread that is unseen. Open our hearts, Lord, and fill our cups to overflowing. Prepare a table of blessing even in the presence of our enemies. Drench us with compassion for the poor. Make us thirsty for justice and liberation of the oppressed. 
and pour out for us the cup of heaven. Come to the table, you who are longing to see God's face. You who are weary from the world, you who have fed on the bread of sorrow, you who have quenched your thirst with tears. Come those, come for the table is ready. For these are the gifts of God, for the people of God. At Emmaus Road, we have only one requirement for gathering around the Lord's table and participating in communion with us. And that is, are you hungry for the presence of God? You don't have to be a member of this church to come to the table with us. We believe that communion is a means of grace and that God can meet you right where you're at. And so as we gather around the Lord's table, would you join me in proclaiming the mystery of our faith? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks, then he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat it, do so in remembrance of me, and be thankful. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me, and be thankful. Having celebrated the generosity of God, we now commit ourselves to living generously in the world. So I invite you to hear this prayer of generosity. But before we do that, and then uh, Christina will come and lead us in the prayers. Um, I just encourage you that if you have come to a place of need in your life, to reach out. Uh, for we would love to do what we can to come alongside of you and help meet that need. On the other side, if you've come this morning ready and prepared to give a financial gift in support of the ministry, you can do so. There are some boxes in our foyer, in our foyer that you can just uh, drop those checks in, or you can also give online at any time. So let's commit ourselves then to generosity by hearing this prayer. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into the world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. Come, Christina, and lead us. Join me in prayer this morning. We praise you, Lord our God, for you are great, you are clothed in splendor and majesty. You are the one who set the earth on its foundation, and it can never be moved. You covered it with watery depths as with a garment, and those waters stood above the mountains. All of the creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. And when you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are satisfied with all good things. When you send your spirit, they are created. And you are the God who renews the earth. So where can we go from your spirit? And where can we flee from your presence? For if we go up to the heavens, you are there. And if we make our beds in the depths, you are there. If we rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far sides of the sea, even there your hand will guide us. Your right hand will hold us fast. Lord, may your glory endure forever. May you rejoice in his works. We will sing praises to you, our God, for as long as we live. So Lord, because you're the giver of all of these good things, we take this time this morning to thank you for all that you have given to us. 
We give thanks for the time that you've provided for us this morning to learn about your practices, to engage with you. We are so grateful for this community to seek you alongside one another. We're grateful for the gift of your spirit who brings us into your kingdom and helps keep us connected to you. We thank you for the many gifts that you have provided that allow us to experience your life-giving presence, the wonders of nature, the sacrament of communion, the intersections that we enjoy with our community of faith. Let us now reflect for a moment to consider all of the other good things that you have received from God and give thanks for them. Lord, most of all, we're grateful for your gift of Jesus, who became like us so that we could become like him, who is in himself the living vine from whom we draw our very lives and all of our spiritual sustenance, and who provides for us eternal life by his life, his victorious death, and his glorious resurrection. So now in the confidence that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us, we bring to you the following requests. Lord, grant us your companionship and patience as we learn how to engage with you to experience the divine in the pursuit of following in your footsteps. We humbly ask that you would so direct our minds, so fill up our imaginations, and guide our wills that we would be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. Let us pray for our world and our nation today, for God's peace and justice to prevail, and for wisdom and guidance for all of our leaders. At this time, please offer up your prayers to God on behalf of those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit. Is there anything else that's weighing on your mind or your spirit? another person, or something in your own life. Let us add that silent request to these that have been mentioned. And now, Lord, as members of your kingdom, we remember and we pray together the prayer that you taught your very first disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and glory forever and ever, amen. There we go. Good morning again. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to worship with you this morning, and aren't we all grateful for Pastor Andy and his growing spirit and willingness to change 15 years on so we don't hear the same things for over, <laughs> over three years. <laughs> As we worship together in song, in the word, in gathering at the table, and in prayer, I now invite you to hold out your hands as we receive this commission inspired by our worship today. Go now and love one another because love is from God. 
proclaim God's salvation to every generation. Remain in Jesus Christ, and like branches of a vine, draw your life from him. And may God, the vine grower, tend you and make you fruitful. May Christ Jesus abide in you and give you life. And may the Holy Spirit cast out all fear and fill you with God's love. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Please join me in singing as we close. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You are dismissed.